request at least twice before, birds and butterflies and reefs three times before. Yeah. So we are very, very lucky to have him and his photographs and knowledge is excellent. Thank you. Um, so yes, I am a amateur nature photographer and naturalist. Um, particularly interested in coral reefs. And today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the variety of animal life that can be found on a coral reef. Um, and let me see if I can get sharing up again. That, and then oh, that. Ooh, and hopefully wonderful. you can all now see a reef scene. Yeah. Good. Okay, so that's working. Um, that's a healthy reef. I had to take myself off mute so you could hear the oohs and ahs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, there we go. Um, so this is a typical coral reef scene. This one is from Fiji. And most people asked about coral reefs would say, oh yeah, it's a lot of coral and fish. And that's the majority of what you see in this shot, fish swimming above the reef, most of what's on the, the, um, the rocks is coral, but there's a lot of other creatures found on the reef too. In fact, if you look at um, the tree of life, sort of all the different kinds of animals, um, there are examples of every one of those found on a reef. Um, this is kind of a classic breakdown of different kinds of animals. Um, I say classic, <laughs> this is the way I learned it, 30, 40 years ago, modern molecular biology has gotten a lot more complicated. But um, from the simplest animals, the sponges, um, through evolutionarily more complex till you get to vertebrates and mammals and us, basically. basically um, and I'm going to go through all of these groups and show that there are examples of all of them on the, re on the reefs. Um, just to show a little more complexity, modern molecular biology has broken life down in, into a lot more complicated set of groups and how they've evolved from each other. Um, and it's still changing as they do research. This is very much a moving target. So I'm going to ignore, ignore this complexity and talk more about the groups of animals as we understood them um, say 30 years ago. So this isn't cutting edge biology, but it will be a lot easier to understand. So the simplest animals are sponges. Um, this is a, a fist sized sponge. It's growing on a sea fan. And um, most people would probably recognize a sponge like this. You um, sometimes run across um, natural sponges sold for home use, although these days most sponges we encounter are actually a, a plastic a manufactured thing. Um, interesting thing about sponges, um, they are so simple that um, there are no differentiated tissues. Every cell in a sponge is equivalent. And you can take a sponge, run it through a blender, pass the result through a fine sieve and let it settle into a bucket of seawater. If you come back the next day, it'll have reassembled into a sponge. Hmm. And you can't do that with the bunny rabbit or, or any higher animal, anything beyond sponges. Um, you mean with a basomatic that doesn't work? No. So every cell in a sponge is equivalent. Every spell, cell feeds for itself. Um, hmm. They do join together to form larger organisms, but they're all similar. Um, in spite of that, sponges take on various shapes. Um, the cells kind of know how to join. To, so like this is a um, vase-shaped sponge. It's hollow in the middle. Um, because every cell feeds for itself, um, every cell needs access to water flowing through, and that's why there are all these holes in it. Um, so that first sponge was this size, this one's a little larger. Sponges, um, some like this, 
are just a very thin layer growing over something else. This would be called an encrusting sponge. Um, some are huge. This is a giant barrel sponge, and people could hide inside it. You know, it's got these big openings. Um, and every reef has sponges on it. Um, they are actually quite common. Um, most of them aren't this large and obvious, so they they can be easy to overlook. Um, moving up the chain to more complex creatures, um, this is something a lot of people probably wouldn't be able to identify. It is not a jellyfish. It is called a tenophore, um, otherwise sometimes called a comb jelly, um, but they are not really jellyfish. Um, this one is about ping pong ball sized. Um, it is gelatinous, meaning it's clear and very soft bodied, um, very fragile. Um, here's another one. And you can see the lines down with tiny little cross hatches on them. Those are, are the combs where the name comb jelly comes from. Um, and um, so these are very simple animals, um, very rudimentary um, nervous system, um, digestive system. And they don't sting. So I, I've run across large groups of them on dives sometimes. Um, you see all the sparkle in this shot. Um, they're often found in cloudy water because they want to feed on other things floating in the water. So that's where they're found. And most of them are pretty small. But these are very primitive animals. I'd like to come forward, but you've taken the entire space. That's it. One uh, like I don't think you'll be seen. I'm going to mute you guys because we can hear you. <laughs> OK. Um, whoops, I'm having done that. Where's my mouse? I just lost control of the slideshow. Um, not all tenophores, however, are gelatinous. These stripy things are also tenophores. Um, and these are parasites. These are um, feeding on a um, starfish. So a lot of these animals can come in different forms. It looks very different. If you dissected one, you'd find it has all the same parts as the other things I was showing you. Um, but moving on to the next group, which would be more familiar, um, would be the Cnidaria. Um, so this phylum contains jellyfish, um, sea anemones, and corals are the main groups of that. And most people are probably somewhat familiar with them. Um, so if you think about a jellyfish, you've got a kind of bulbous body. Um, usually a ring of tentacles, and there's a mouth on the bottom. So it's a, a cup-shaped body with a single opening. Um, it feeds through the mouth. It ejects waste back through that single opening. Um, it's a pretty simple body form. Um, but um, they are capable of movement. So like this one is called a blue crown jelly. And if we go to the next slide. Uh, Oh, that's interesting. Oh, I've got to play the video here. There we go. Um, so you see that they they have muscles in their bell, and they actually actively swim. They um, they contract the bell and they have control over where they go. Um, they don't have fully eyes, but um, they can sense light and dark and they can taste or, or smell things in the water. So they actively swim around looking for food. Um, the frilly bits hanging in the bottom are feeding tentacles. That's how they catch food. Um, okay, I want to go back to the other view. Uh oh, oh! I hate when that happens. Hang on. Um. Let's 
sorry. I've, I've now locked the slideshow to my other screen. Not what I was trying to do. Um, shift command. F there we go. Oh, sorry about that. This, Those could be parasites I, from the door. I thought I had the technology going and full screen. Okay. Um, so this is also a, a uh, jellyfish. Um, these are called upside down jellies. Um, it's free swimming. It, they can swim like the other one we just saw, but they spend most of their time upside down on the sand. Um, the pale bits sticking up are some of their tentacles. So they're camouflaged as just little bits of growing algae and muck so mm -hmm. that fish don't see them there and might get too close. And if the fish touch the tentacles, they get stung and then the um, jellyfish can eat them. <clears throat> so um, yeah, those are jellyfish. Um, they are closely related to sea anemones. Now, um, most people associate anemones with clownfish. Here's a pair of clownfish living in an anemone. Um, if you look at the whole animal, though, this is the same kind of anemone. In fact, there are a few clownfish in this one. Um, they can be quite large, a um, lot of tentacles, but it's the same body plan as the jellyfish I was just showing. There's one mouth in the center and a ring of tentacles around it. But rather than being free swimming, they sit on the bottom. Um, if we look at this one, it's now mostly closed up and you can see the body. Um, body sits on the bottom. Um, the other end is just lots of tentacles. Um, anemones come in a lot of shapes and sizes and colors. Um, the, the, of course, what I'm showing here is one of the flashiest ones that often has blue or purple on it. Um, this is also an anemone. Um, this particular kind um, digs in soft sediment. So its body is buried down in the sand, but again, it's a ring of tentacles around a mouth in the middle. Um, another example of an anemone. <clears throat> um, this is a coral. Now I said jellyfish, anemones, and corals are all members of the same group. And you may say, but this looks so different. Um, it actually, for the most part, follows the same body plan as the last two. Um, corals are known as colonial animals because a whole lot of individuals join together into a larger mass. Um, can, can you guys see my mouse cursor or, or not? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So um, this bit is a kind of substrate that grows connecting the bases of them, but each one of these is animals Oh, has the same, it's called a polyp, and has the same body plan as the anemone and the jellyfish. Um, so a coral is a collection of polyps, each one of which is a ring of tentacles around a mouth, and um, they often grow together from their base. Um, this one type is called um, a soft coral because there's no hard skeleton under it. Um, it has this shape, it inflates itself with seawater. Um, this particular one is Dendronethia, sometimes called carnation coral. Um, this is the same kind of coral when it hasn't inflated its body with water. Um, now all of those polyps are pressed together and it takes a much smaller space. Um, so the same way anemones sometimes open up really large or shrink down, um, the soft corals can do that too. Um, <laughs> Given the trouble I have with the last video, I'm not going to try and play this. This is a video showing this particular coral. Um, these would pulse open and close about once every two seconds, all of these polyps. Um, but each one of these is a ring of eight tentacles around a mouth. Um, so similar in shape to what we saw before, um, but they're growing out of a common base. Um, Corals take a lot of different shapes. 
Um, this one's called wire coral. Um, it's about as big around as a pencil maybe. And I've seen them um, 15, 20 feet long sometimes, although not usually that long. Um, there, it forms a um, skeleton that's hard, but somewhat flexible, kind of like our fingernails or, or animal horn. And around the outside are polyps again. Each polyp is a ring of tentacles around a mouth. Um, so like this is the same kind of coral a close up and with the fish on it, but you can see each of the polyps is a ring of tentacles around a mouth. Um, and all corals take this form. Um, this is probably what a lot of people think of when you hear coral. Um, this one would be um, an acropora or staghorn coral, um, which forms branching thickets like this. Um, this is from the group known as hard corals, which form a skeleton of calcium carbonate, which is basically like limestone. Um, and people have often seen um, dead coral skeletons that are sold as curios or washed up on a beach. Um, living corals have flesh covering that, and it's covered with polyps, again, which are rings of tentacles around a mouth. Um, they're really tiny on these, but if you look really close, you would see them. Um, so like this is um, not the same kind of coral. This one's uh, a euphilia. But you can see these, um, it's just packed with tentacles. You'd have to kind of look down between them to find the mouths. But there are rings of tentacles around mouths on this. Um, <clears throat> This coral, which is called a goniopora coral or flower pot coral, you can more clearly see um, each of the polyps with the ring of tentacles around the mouth. Um, these hang off of long stalks, but there is a, a common base over a hard um, calcium skeleton. Corals can grow huge. Um, what you see on the left half of this shot is a single um, colony of Porites coral or mound coral. Um, this one is about 30 feet around. It, it's basically dome shaped. It's sitting in about 20, 25 feet of water and goes nearly to the surface. Um, this is a spot in Fiji. I visit every time I'm there. Um, scientists have taken core samples of this one and estimate it's 2,000 years old. Um, and most of this mound is a single coral an animal. Well, a colony of them made up of millions and millions of these tiny polyps. And yes, there are a few other things growing on the outside surface. Coral grows very slowly, but it does grow. Um, some portions have died, but parts are still alive. And will, as long as it's healthy, will actually then overgrow the dead parts. Um, so coral is kind of weird in that it has growth patterns that feel a little like a plant in some ways, but it is definitely an animal. Um, another form coral grows in, so these are flat sheets that are kind of wrinkly and curved. Um, each sheet can be um, 18 inches, um, two or even three feet tall, and these grow in large thickets again. But if you look at the upper surface, it's covered in polyps. And so that's just the common form of uh, corals. Um, not all corals are colonial. So this one, the entire animal is a single polyp. And this one's probably three or four inches across. But there's a mouth here in the middle and a lot of uh, tentacles around it. Um, this one looks like it has lots of tentacles. If you counted them, there would be a multiple of six. Um, all stony corals with the calcium-based skeleton under them have either six tentacles or a multiple of six. The soft ones that just inflate their bodies with seawater always have eight tentacles or a multiple of eight. So I'm going to move on to the next group of animals now, which are, which are flatworms. Um, so mo most of the previous group, the cnidarians, um, tend to just stay in one place. Um, yes, um, jellyfish can move around. Um, 
and some anemones do too. Um, corals can very slowly, but um, flatworms are, are free swimming, very, very simple animals. Again, um, there's a single body opening that is both mouth and where waste is ejected. There's a very primitive um, neural system, but no real centralized brain. So these two little bits sticking up at one end um, are sensory. That's where it kind of smells what's around it. Um, they do have musculature. Um, this one is, is actually free swimming. So he's been swimming across an area and is about to land on this coral. Um, this particular one is known as a uh, Persian carpet flatworm or Pseudobiceros bedfordi, um, and is maybe two or three inches long. Um, so the first groups I showed, the, the sponges and the corals, um, the ocean is basically the only place you'll find them. Um, flatworms are also found um, terrestrially. They're only in water, but there are some found in freshwater ponds as well. Um, some of you may remember in, in uh, high school biology, often you, you would work on planaria. Um, planaria are flatworms. They're not as colorful as these, but they are flatworms. So they are found in places other than the ocean. The ones on coral reefs tend to be brightly colored. This one's a divided flatworm. Um, this one oh, it doesn't have a common name. It's another Pseudobiceros. But um, they tend to come in bright colors, um, which is a warning that they don't taste good, so that predators won't eat them. And I don't know how often that works, but that, um, they're fun to see. Moving up to the next group um, are segmented worms. Um, there are a lot of them in the ocean. They're on, on land, but not seen a lot. The one type, type that's probably familiar to you guys, the earthworms, um, are members of the same group. Um, so we're finally up to a, a kind of animal that um, has an opening at either end of the digestive tract. So it now has a mouth on one end and expels waste on the other. All the animals we've seen up until now have a single opening. So we're now getting into more complex animals. Um, it's still mostly round, although some like this have a bit of symmetry to the sides. Um, these tufts down the side um, are actually sharp, tiny spines. Um, so it's a form of defense. Um, you don't want to touch these. Those spines will stick in you and, and hurt. Um, they can be very small. Some actually get quite large. Um, this one's maybe half an inch around and six or eight inches long. Um, they, so um, another kind of polychaete worm, this one, the spines are much larger and more obvious. Um, you really don't want to touch them. They, they can get you. Um, but for the most part, they're eating tiny little microscopic things in the sand. Um, this is something any of you who've ever snorkeled in the tropics may have seen. These are called Christmas tree worms. They come in lots of bright colors. This is actually the head of a worm. The worm itself looks something like the others we were looking at. Um, the, the worms themselves are never exposed, but um, so they live in a tube bored into a coral like this. And the part that's sticking out are the gills. So it's a pair of, of gills that are spiraled. And that's also a feeding apparatus. They use those to catch tiny little or bits of organic matter floating by in the water and then pass it down to the center where it um, ends up being fed down to a, a mouth that's not visible. Um, they never leave their holes. Um, when so these guys, when they reproduce, the, the, their babies, the larvae, float with the plankton in the open ocean. And after um, a few weeks, when they're old enough to want to settle down and start looking like their parents, um, these tiny little microscopic things 
will swim down and find a coral and start building a, a hole there. And they're basically just never seen other than on a coral head like this. Um, <clears throat> they may seem defenseless, these little bits waving around. Um, what they do is lightning fast, they can pull back down into their hole and disappear. So um, they can sense light and dark if the shadow passes over them, they will pull back and disappear. Um, they can feel motion in the water. So taking a photograph like this is challenging. If you try and get close to them, they sense you there and they pull back and you see this little um, yeah. thing sticking out on the side of each one, it's a door. So the body pulls back into the hole these two spiral things pull in and that door closes over the hole. And this is a, little, a hard bit and that protects the animal from a predator that might try and get it. <clears throat> um, this is a, so these guys tend to be maybe an inch, inch and a half apart. This is a much larger sense animal that's somewhat similar. Again, it's a worm and we're looking at the gills and the feeding apparatus the worm stays buried. Um, so I've said most of them are small and filter feeders. Um, this one's called a bobbit worm. Um, this one is maybe an inch across and probably a couple feet long. And these are vicious predators. It's in soft sand. It can move around quite quickly in the sand. And these guys will catch fish swimming above them. Um, they lunge out of the sand and have little tiny claws around their mouths that will latch onto a fish and actually pull it back down into the sand. Um, they're quite vicious and people are warned to stay away from them. They, they can't see very well, so they wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a two or three inch long fish and a scuba diver who happens to have part of their body down near the sand. It, um, and while they couldn't actually pull you into the sand, you'd get a nasty bite from them if they tried. So those were all examples of, of segmented worms. The next more complicated group moving up the evolutionary tree are crustaceans. Or actually, arthropod is the more general term. Um, and you are all familiar with arthropods if you think about it, because um, insects, which are the most plentiful animals on Earth, are arthropods as well. Um, there's a lot similar between insects and shrimp and crabs, which are the most common arthropods found in, in the ocean. Um, this one we're looking at isn't actually a shrimp. This is krill. <clears throat> You've probably heard if you've ever watched a nature special about the Arctic, um, there are um, huge schools of, of krill, millions and millions of them in the Arctic oceans and such. Um, they form the base of the food chain in the colder parts of the ocean. They're not common in the tropics, but they are there. Um, so this is like maybe a half inch long. It's a little thing that looks a lot like shrimp, but this one's actually krill. And we're not on a reef. I'm up in near the surface in open ocean over a thousand feet of water when I shot this. Um, but just to give you an example of what some of the different crustaceans are found in the ocean. Um, this one is called a skeleton shrimp. Um, maybe half an inch long, so something very small again. Um, long thin body, you can see a pair of eyes here. This is the body. Um, these, there are claws at the end of these long arms. It's got antenna. Um, they're called skeleton because they're so long and thin. Um, they can be very common on a lot of reefs, but they're very easy to overlook. They're transparent, they're tiny. They wave around catching even smaller animals that swim around. Um, this is the shrimp. Um, so not the same kind you would eat in a restaurant, but um, we're at least into the same family now. Um, most of the, the shrimp that humans consume are from um, colder waters. From, so, um, the tropical shrimp are a little bit different, often more colorful. 
Look, this guy is probably three inches long. Um, I don't, actually, I do know the species on this one. It, it's a metapenopsis, if anyone cares. <laughs> um, but shrimp come in a lot of shapes and colors. Um, so this is a tropical shrimp called a, um, a marble shrimp. These guys come in an amazing number of patterns and colors, some pretty wild. So it's got these hairy bits on its legs and on parts of its back. It's got polka dots. It's got this reticulated pattern. It's got stripes. Um, some of them are quite spectacular. Um, and again, it's not small. This is two or three inches long. Um, these guys are only out at night. So I was on a night dive to see it. Um, other shrimp, these are transparent, trying to stay hidden. A lot of things like to eat shrimp on a reef. So shrimps have different strategies to try to evade predators. These are really transparent. Um, but not that small. These are maybe an inch long. Um, these are, uh, what are these? Mana pontonia shrimp. Um, a lot of these sea creatures don't have common names. So Latin names are all I have to give you as to what they're called. Um, these shrimp are really obviously brightly colored. These are Coleman shrimp. These do have name. Um, anytime something is really obvious like this, it's a warning. In this case, the shrimp themselves um, don't really have defense, but the thing they're perched on is called a fire urchin. It's a kind of sea urchin with a vicious sting. I've touched one once. I know how much they hurt. You don't want to touch them. Um, so that's their defense, is living on this, this urchin. And somehow, they don't trigger the urchin to sting it, to sting them. Um, the larger one would be female, the smaller one male. They're generally seen in pairs like this. Um, these are actually pretty closely related emperor shrimp. They're on a sea cucumber. Um, so the larger one is probably a little under an inch. Again, um, larger one is female, the smaller one would be male. Um, I always look for these guys. Um, I don't actually know why these are brightly colored because I don't think they have any good defense and the sea cucumber is not going to help. But um, yeah, they're seen with some regularity. Um, shrimp just come in so many shapes and, and colors. So it, you, it's probably hard to find the shrimp in this one. This is the eye down here. It's facing down. The mouth parts are down here. Um, this is the body. This is the tail all the way up here. There's some very short legs down in this section, and it's just holding on to this stalk, which I believe is actually a tall, thin sponge that it's perched on. Um, so this guy's relying on camouflage to not be found. Um, these guys are obviously colored. These are, are um, referred to as cleaner shrimp. Um, these provide a service to fish, so fish are unlikely to try and eat them. Um, they help clean uh, parasites and dead skin off of fish who can't clean themselves. And um, they, they will even um, clean your fingers if a diver comes and puts your hand down in front of them. Um, so you put your hand there and become very still. The shrimp will, will come on you and, and kind of feel around for if you have any little cuts or, or imperfections in your skin, they'll tug at that. Um, they're trying to, to clean you up, to groom you. And if, um, as a diver, if you take the scuba regulator out of your mouth and hold your mouth open close to them, they will go and clean your teeth because this is part of what they do for fish. <laughs> um, I find that a little difficult to do underwater, but I've seen people do it. Um, Again, just the variety of uh, <clears throat> shrimp. This one is called a harlequin shrimp. Um, another, so the red and white stripe thing here is another kind of shrimp. This one lives in close association with the fish. Um, so they have a symbiosis going on. The shrimp digs a hole and, and maintains a burrow. Um, but this shrimp, it has very poor eyesight, it's nearly blind. 
the fish um, stands sentry, warns the sh shrimp if there are any predators nearby, um, helps find food, which it drags back into the burrow and shares with the, the shrimp. So they live cooperatively. Um, this is a lobster. This one's a painted lobster. So this one's probably a foot long. It's a little hard to make out the whole thing. It's back in a hole. Um, different from New England lobster, um, instead of big claws, it has um, these antenna that are um, covered with lots of tiny short spines and you don't want to touch one. They can defend themselves with that. Um, moving on from shrimp to crabs. Um, you're probably familiar with hermit crabs. Some of them get quite large. This one's probably fist size. Um, this one is a white spotted hermit crab. Um, this one, I don't have a name for this one. Um, but again, fairly large. Um, they have soft bodies, so to protect themselves, that they live in abandoned snail shells. Or most of them do. This is another kind of hermit crab that finds an abandoned wormhole in a coral head and lives in that hole instead of in a snail shell. So they're stuck in one place. They can't move around because they're in a hole in coral, but it gives them protection and they are just tiny hermit crabs. Um, lots of free swimming crabs are on the reef as well. Um, this one is a um, polka dotted guard crab. Um, it's called a guard crab because it lives inside branching corals and helps protect the coral from fish that would come try and eat the coral. Um, it'll actually wave its claws out and, and threaten anything that comes close. Um, Crabs live in all kinds of strange places. This one is inside the anus of a sea cucumber. Um, it's a protective place for the crab. Um, it, it's not really a symbiosis. The, the sea cucumber gets nothing from it. Um, it's just a place where the crab can um, hang out to be protected. And the crab ventures out to find food sometimes and goes back to somewhere that it finds safe. Um, here's a pair of crabs, probably um, a mated pair, hanging out on a sea cucumber, oh, I'm sorry, a sea pen. Um, these are por called porcelain crabs. Um, a zebra crab. So they, there's an immense number of colors and shapes you find in crabs. Um, this is a different kind of porcelain crab. Um, this one, it its um, feeding legs in front of its mouth have these feathery structures on them. Um, so this one nets tiny particles out of the water with those feathery structures and pulls them back into its mouth is how this one feeds. And it's perched on a um, sea anemone. A different group that's less well known, this one's called a mantis shrimp. It's not truly really a shrimp at all, it's another Another kind of crustacean unique from either shrimp or crabs. Um, these are vicious predators. Um, you don't want, <laughs> as a diver, you don't want to get close to them. This one's probably four or five inches long. Um, <clears throat> this one is called a peacock mantis because of its bright colors. So um, these, this front pair of claws are referred to as raptorial appendages. Um, they have some of the fastest motion of any known animal. And um, this particular one, um, so there are smashers and slashers. Um, these, this um, type of shrimp is a smasher. So these claws end in a kind of bulbous club. It can fling them out faster than the eye can see and hit something with it um, hard enough to crack the shell on a snail or crab to break coral. Um, people have ended up with these in aquariums and they can break the glass in an aquarium oh. just by flinging those claws out wow. super fast. Um, this one has claws like that. Um, this one's called a blue fronted mantis because of the blue spots here. Um, there's a sharp edge on there. Again, it can fling those 
arms out really quickly, but there's a razor sharp, sharp edge on that. One of these can take your finger off if you get your hands too close to it. Um, they are vicious predators. I don't worry about them. Um, they're pretty intelligent and they're not gonna attack something so much larger than they are. But if you accidentally put your hand on one or back them into a corner, they will defend themselves. And, but fish that are more their size have a lot to fear from these guys. So those were all examples of uh, crustaceans, different arthropods found in the ocean. Uh, evolutionarily more complex are mollusks. Um, and a lot of people might look and go, really, mollusks are more complex than, um, than shrimp and crabs? Um, from a biology standpoint, if you dissect them, yeah, there's more complexity to their body. Um, mollusks take on a number of different forms as well. Um, so this is a cowrie snail. Um, what we call snails have a single shell and a soft fleshy body that lives in that snail. Um, so here you see there's a pair of eyes, there's a pair of tentacles it can, um, that it can taste and, and touch with. Um, this is its, its feeding apparatus and this thing sticking up is, this, is what it breathes through. Um, the reason it sticks up like a snorkel um, this guy spends a lot of time partly buried in the sand with just this sticking up so that it can breathe. Um, I found this at night when it was up on top cruising around and they can move pretty quickly. Um, probably a, a couple inches a second, just moving along. Um, <clears throat> some snails can get quite large. This, this one was probably um, four or five inches long. Um, this is a cone snail. Um, if you ever see one of these on the beach, do not touch it. Um, cone snails are vicious predators. They move slowly, um, well, relatively slowly compared to fish and, and such. Um, but um, so if you look at it, you've got a, a shell that's like maybe four inches long. Um, here's an eye. So there's a pair of eyes, a pair of um, sensory. Um, antenna, the mouth parts. This thing sticking up is kind of like the snorkel we looked at. There's a, a poison barb on the end of this. And um, it's actually, I, I forget what class of poisons it is, um, but it can kill a person. And um, the shells tend to be pretty. So naive shell collectors, when they see them might want to pick them up. Um, if the animal's dead and it's an empty shell, sure, you can pick it up. But if it's somehow washed up into shallow water and it's not dead, um, and you, you pick it up, even if you hold this back end, look how long that tentacle is. It can reach its back end and, if you, and um, <clears throat> sting someone who, who picks it up. So um, when I see these while I'm diving, I'm careful not to get too close to them. I know they can reach six or eight inches from themselves, but they, they can be quite pretty. Um, so those were snails with a single shell. There's a bunch of mollusks with, with no shell. Um, they're related to slugs on land. Um, so this group is generically be called sea slugs. Um, this one, oh, it doesn't have a common name, Lycia marginata. Um, but a lot of them can be pretty. Um, this one's a couple inches long. Um, another kind of sea slug. Um, this one's referred to as a head shield slug because of the shape of the head. A um, little smaller, maybe an inch long. Um, this one's from a group known as sea hares. Um, these are not dangerous. If you see one in a tide pool, you can pick it up. They're very soft and velvety. Um, they don't like to be picked up. They're going to withdraw into a ball. Um, so it's, you should be very gentle with them if you try and interact with them. And 
like a number of mollusks, when they're harassed, they can release ink. So you'll see a purple cloud around them if, if you harass them, which they're hoping will help them get away. Um, I find them really interesting animals. Um, no obvious eyes, but you can see they have um, two pairs of sensory tentacles, their mouth parts on the underside, um, another kind of sea hair. Um, and I, I've seen these in tide pools in California. I don't think I've ever seen one in the Northeast. They're around, they're not as common. Um, and a lot of them in the tropics. Um, so the bigger group that these shellless um, mollusks belong to are known as epistogranics. Um, this one is called a moon-headed sidegill slug. And these are big, maybe six inches long, cruise around the sand, kind of interesting creatures. Um, these can be over a foot long. They're, um, this is called a pleurobranch. And I find these fascinating because they only come out at night. Um, as a diver, I can visit a reef during the day and you won't see any of them. You visit the same reef at night and there might be dozens of these wandering around. Where does a basketball-sized creature vanish to during the day? <clears throat> um, they're slow moving. Um, they, they probably partly rely on size to protect themselves because there, there are creatures out at night who would probably try and eat them. Um, a favorite group of creatures among scuba divers, which are also another form of shellless mollusk, are nudibranchs. Um, the name nudibranch means bare lung. Um, so this feathery structure at the back are the exposed gills. That's where the name comes from. Um, there's a pair of sensory um, antennae at the front called rhinophores. The mouth parts are on the underside. Um, nudibranchs vary from tiny ones that are a fraction of an inch up to six or eight inches long. Most of them are one or two inches and come in a huge variety of bright colors and patterns. Um, this one is, what is this? This is William's nudibranch. This one is called the Magnificent Nudibranch. Um, this one is, what is, oh, how funny. These are both have a common name of Magnificent Nudibranch. Um, different families of nudibranchs, but again, you see this feathery structure in the back of the gills pair of rhinophores, mouth parts that are hard to see. Lots of just different shapes and colors. This one um, is Kuhn's nudibranch. Um, these are Bullock's nudibranch. So this is a pair of them mating. Um, they're all from functional hermaphrodites. They're all both male and female. They mate right shoulder to right shoulder. So their genitalia are on the right side. <clears throat> and because they're, they're, all of them are both male and female, there's a negotiation of who's going to get impregnated when they mate. Um, it's more difficult to be a mother to um, have to produce eggs than it is to just provide sperm and wander off. So. Both of them typically want to be the sperm provider. And sometimes there's a little bit of fight over who's going to impregnate who. <clears throat> um, and from the shot, I can't even, you can't tell how, how that's going, but um, it's not uncommon to run across pairs of them doing this. Um, just so many different shapes and patterns in nudibranchs. Um, this one is a uh, Batongus halgerda. <clears throat> and yet another. So um, there are people who specialize in nudibranchs, who just go diving looking for them. And uh, I'm kind of fascinated by them. I haven't studied them enough to be an expert on them. Um, so we talked about mollusks with one shell, mollusks with no shells. This is a mollusk with two shells. Um, or a bivalve, this is a giant clam. 
Um, this one is maybe 18 inches across. Um, so any of you who watched Jacques Cousteau or old sea hunt specials, the diver gets his foot caught in the clam, oh no. That's really unlikely to happen, but some of them are large enough it could. Um, they can close quickly, but they don't want something stuck in their mantle. They're not going to close on you. That's kind of a piece of invented drama. Um, and the giant clams like this, they are filter feeders. So they're filling, feeding on tiny particles in the water. This opening, so um, you can't see, there's two openings. One that draws in water and one that it expels water from. And it just pumps water through its body and filters out tiny bits of food. Um, this is another kind of giant clam, a much smaller one. This one's only probably um, four inches across. Um, the smaller ones are often more brightly colored. Um, this is a scallop. Now, this, the scallops we eat aren't typically this brightly colored. Um, this one's called an iridescent scallop and it's living in a crevice in live coral. The row of red spots are eyes. So it has only rudimentary vision, but if a predator, a, a fish that might try and take a nip from the, the soft fleshy bits comes by, it can see them enough to close its shell to protect itself. Um, this is a, an oyster that's like a foot across. It's a, dinner plate size oyster. Um, the shells are completely overgrown with coral and sponges and things. So there's shell here and here. These tiny little yellow bits are a bunch of eye stalks. Whoops. Um, oh, yeah. There we go. Um, and this is all the fleshy interior um, in the opening there. So this is a thorny oyster. Um, this is a different kind of oyster. Um, this one's closer to the, to the kind we eat, but again, it's a tropical species, not relate, act, close, actually related to the ones we eat. This one's on the root of a mangrove tree. The other major group of mollusks are cephalopods. Um, the name means headfoot um, because they have a, a simple butt body where the head is just on one end of it and they swim from the back end of their body. Um, and cephalopods are actually quite intelligent. You've probably heard stories about how smart octopuses can be at solving puzzles and such. Um, these are reef squid. So um, body is back here. There's a fin around it they use to swim. Um, they have 10 tentacles. Um, eight short ones and two longer ones used for feeding. So it's a somewhat similar plan to an octopus. Um, another view of a, a reef squid. Um, this is a cuttlefish, very similar to squid, um, but where the body of a squid is entirely soft, um, there's a bone in, inside a cuttlefish. Um, but again, there's eight tentacles hanging down here plus these two, which are the feeding tentacles. Um, these guys are clearly somewhat smart. They tend to watch and um, divers and kind of fall, follow you from a distance. They're very wary. Um, and these guys can be up to a foot long. This is this particular one is called a broad club cuttlefish. Um, this is a much smaller cuttlefish. This one's only a couple of inches long. Um, and it's perched in a soft coral here, just kind of hanging out. Um, <clears throat> this is called a flamboyant cuttlefish. Um, these are something I've, I've specifically looked for, um, very prized by divers to find. Um, they often have these brilliant colors and they walk around on the sand. They're capable of swimming, but they tend um, to walk with two of the, two of their legs, and they are vicious predators of small fish. They move around very slowly. Um, when they find a fish, their feeding tentacles can shoot out faster than the eye can see, and those feeding tentacles are longer than their body. So these are pretty small, 
the animal's between one and three inches long and its tentacles can reach four or five inches. And so they can nab a fish. Um, I was gonna show you video of this, but I had so much trouble with the last video. I'm not gonna try and actually play the video. Sorry about that. Um, this, is, this one's called a bobtail squid. It's a different group that's, again, another, another kind of cephalopod related to squid and octopus somewhere in between. Um, shares a lot of uh, features in the body plan. Um, and these are, these are octopus. Um, these are called day octopus. They're the kind commonly seen out in the day on reefs in the South Pacific. And this is a pair of mating. Um, they tend to be solitary. You rarely see them together, partly because they can also um, be cannibalistic. Um, but these are together because they're mating. Um, it's very tricky to tell which is the male and which is the female. Um, on males, the third right arm is shaped different on the end, and that's the arm they use to uh, transfer sperm mm -hmm. when they mate. Since each one is reaching under the other, I don't know which is which <laughs> in this case. But um, yeah, I was with eight other scuba divers and this pair were mating on top of the reef and just kind of kept doing their thing and kind of watching us. And we watched them for a good 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. That that was pretty unusual, not something I've seen very often. Um, other octopus, um, this one's tiny, maybe an inch long. This is something else you never want to pick up. This is a blue ring octopus. Um, there's the joke about how many things in Australia will kill you. This is another thing that will kill you. Um, only found in Australia and uh, Indonesia, places nearby there. It's called a blue ring octopus. And again, has a venom that's a nerve toxin. If they bite you, you probably won't survive. Um, they're tiny, they're not going to attack you. If you harass one, if you try and catch it, um, try and pick one up in your hands, not a good idea. Um, so it's not obvious looking at an octopus. The mouth is at the center where all the legs come together and is, is rarely exposed or visible. There's a hard beak in the mouth um, made, made of a horn-like material. And um, most octopus um, actually have a poison. So when they can bite a fish or whatever they catch and they'll inject the poison into them so that the creature they've caught dies, so it's easier for them to eat them. Otherwise, they'd have a hard time killing the things that they eat. Um, this one's called a coconut octopus. Um, weird animals. It was moving like it was walking on two legs. No good reason to walk underwater. They can swim. They have all these legs. This one was up on two of them moving like it was walking. Octopuses just do all kinds of weird things. Um, this one's called a mimic octopus. Um, I, I love, oh, actually no, this, right, this is the mimic octopus. So, um, I was gonna tell you a story about a different one. Um, they can change their shape to look kind of like a lionfish, like a sole. Um, <laughs> like a clump of seaweed. Um, so yeah, they're, they're interesting creatures and only a couple inches across. So those were the mollusks. Um, how am I doing on time? Oh, it's been almost an hour. Okay, we'll get through this last group pretty quickly. Um, the next group, more complicated, are echinoderms. And these tend to be kind of foreign to most people just because the biology looks so weird. Um, there are animals that have five-sided symmetry. So we started with the really primitive animals. The sponges have no symmetry at all. Um, the corals and the worms tend to be round, have radial symmetry. By the time we got up to our um, crustaceans and mollusks, um, 
we have lateral symmetry. They're now symmetrical side to side. Echinoderms have five-sided symmetry. It's, that's a little odd. So um, starfish are familiar to most people, um, tend to usually have five arms. Um, there's a lot of weird things about their biology. They, um, they, they don't have muscles the way a lot of animals do. They have a hydraulic system. They pump seawater in and out of um, <clears throat> glands in their body to move. And um, they have lots of tiny little feet on the underside, a mouth on the underside of the center with the legs come together. Um, so this one is a Fromia star, a um, couple inches across. Um, this one was big, it was over a foot across and weird polka dot patterns. Um, not many things eat starfish. So for the most part, they don't worry about um, defense or trying to, to hide. Um, this one's probably a more familiar pattern than the, what people would think of as a typical starfish. Um, but they don't all have five arms. Most do. This one has seven. So there are, there are some species that are known for having six or seven arms. And then um, some starfish just have a different number of arms for most of their brothers. The, um, you've probably heard if you cut an arm off a starfish, it can regrow. Um, when they're injured, they, they can regenerate. They may not regrow the same number of arms they started with. Um, it's just somewhat variable. Um, so this kind of looks like just a big ball. It's called a cushion star. If you look careful, it has five-sided symmetry and is actually a kind of starfish. Just the arms are so short to basically be non-existent. But there are points where I'm moving, whoops. Here, you, you can kind of tell there's five points. Um, and if you turned it over and looked at the underside, there's a mouth in the middle and um, five things moving out from it. So it is a starfish with just very short arms called a cushion star. Another group of echinoderms um, are called feather stars or crinoids. Um, it shares a lot in the body plan of the previous one, even though it may not be obvious to look at this. Um, there's a lot of arms, but there's always a multiple of five of them. Um, this one probably has 20 or 25 arms. Um, there's a mouth in the center on the bottom. Um, the way it breathes and moves, it's um, from from a uh, biology standpoint, it's very similar to a starfish, even though it looks somewhat different. And these guys on some reefs can be quite common. So this bright yellow one, this one that's black with yellow stripes, this green one, these that are just black, these are all feather stars or crinoids. Um, so some of them are kind of wrapped up into a ball. This one's somewhat open, this is more open. There's another one over here, there's one here. Some reefs, there can be a lot of them. Um, and um, here's a close-up of one. Um, different species than the others, but here you can see there's a ring of modified legs it uses to hold on, and then the larger legs it uses to feed with. Um, if they're startled or threatened, they can actually free swim through the water. They uncurl and curl up and, and open their legs quickly. And doing that, they can swim through the water, which is kind of interesting to see, to try and get away from a, a predator. Um, closely related to the feather stars are what are called basket stars. So again, a lot of legs, but here the legs branch into smaller and smaller bits. Um, so somewhere there's a small disc that's the central body. And then these heavy legs come off of it that branch into smaller and smaller bits. During the day, these guys fold up into a softball-sized ball that's very tightly coiled. 
And at night they spread out, it could be a couple feet across and just spread this, this net of their arms that they used to catch things to eat. Um, brittle stars. Um, again, it's a starfish. There's a disc of a body, five arms. Um, the arms are lined with these um, spines. So that's their form of defense. Um, it's not a good defense. They move slowly. So often they hide their body in a crevice and just the arms hang out. Um, to give an idea of some of the size difference among echinoderms, um, these are a whole bunch of tiny little brittle stars. These brittle stars are no more than half an inch long. Um, and they're wrapped around the spines on the body of a starfish that's probably um, two feet across. So there's this huge starfish covered in tiny little starfish. So this is just a close up of the skin of the big starfish showing all these tiny little, little stars on it. Um, sea urchins. Um, again, it's an echinoderm, very similar body plan. There's five sided symmetry. And this one, you can see the stripes from the center. There's five of them. Um, and there are a multiple of five spines, but usually there's so many spines that's not at all obvious. Um, there's a mouth on the bottom. So a, a lot of starfish, it's not obvious where they eject waste from. The um, urchins like this, this is the anus on top. So the mouth's on the bottom and waste is ejected from the top. Um, <clears throat> As a diver or snorkeler, you want to be very careful around these. Um, the spines on this one are probably six or eight inches long and needle sharp. And if you brush your hand or foot against one, they'll pierce your skin and break off. They're very brittle. And um, it can be very dangerous. It takes a surgeon to remove broken spines from someone. And those injuries often get infected. So it's actually a big deal. To if you get impaled on one, it's important to see a doctor. Um, not all urchins have long spines like that. This is another kind of urchin. Um, similar body plan, there's a mouth in the center of the underside, um, five-sided symmetry. You can see these blue panels. There's five large ones and five smaller ones between them, and a bunch of spines. Here, the spines are very short, and so many are not really countable. Uh, another kind of urchin. So last was a succedo urchin. This one is called a radiant sea urchin. Um, but again, similar body plan. This one has both long spikes and short spines. This is also an urchin. Um, the spines are modified to be short with a flaring tip. So this one's called a flower urchin. So it looks like it has little flowers growing on it. Um, nasty sting. Don't touch them. Um, the last group of echinoderms I'm going to talk about are sea cucumbers. Um, this one's probably three or four feet long. It's a huge thing. It moves very slowly. Um, it feeds by drawing sand into its body and mm -hmm. digesting the bacteria and tiny stuff growing on the sand and out the back end um, ejects clean sand. So it, it's, it actually vacuums up sand, cleans it, and it ejects cleaner sand out its back. That's how they feed. They move slowly around. Um, so they're actually helpful around reefs. They help keep the area clean. Um, unfortunately, the Japanese and the French like eating sea cucumber, and there are places where they've been over harvested, which is a bit of a problem. I've never tried eating them myself. Um, Another sea cucumber, this one's also pretty large. This one's called a pineapple cucumber. Um, this is a slightly smaller one called grape sea cucumber. Um, some of them are, they're not all huge. Um, so this one's only maybe two inches long. This one is, um, what is this? Just called yellow sea cucumber. And so I'm up to the last phylum now. <clears throat> And um, 
This may not look familiar to most of you. This animal is called um, a tunicate or sea squirt. And you may say, last phylum, what about us? Um, so tunicates um, are actually chordates. They have a spinal cord, or rather they have a notochord. So they have a centralized brain and a brain stem that runs the length of their body. Um, they don't have a skeleton. There's no vertebra or spine around that notochord, but they do have that shaped nervous system. And so <clears throat> we are related to these guys. Um, most of them um, are sessile. They attach to the reef in one spot and never move. Um, so this one is maybe fist sized. It's called a golden um, tunicate. Um, these are much smaller. Each one of these is about half an inch tall and they tend to grow in dense colonies like this. So for most of them, you see individual animals. Each animal has two siphons, one that it draws water in and one that it expels water from. So they pump a constant stream of water through themselves. And um, they, again, are feeding on tiny bits of organic matter floating in the water. They're filter feeders. Um, the name tunicate comes because some of them, like that first one, look something like a leather tunic. Um, they come in a lot of shapes and sizes. Um, so here you can see each animal with two siphons. Is this globular thing sticking out on a stalk coming from a common base? Um, most of them attached to the reef. Um, some of them float in open water. This is called a siphonophore. Um, it's a kind of tunicate. Each one of these animals that's probably two or three inches tall um, has the body plan of the tunicates we were looking at earlier. Um, the op opaque brown bits, I believe, are the gonads on these, and the rest of the body is translucent, looking kind of like a jellyfish. And they join together into chains that can be 20 or 30 feet long and just drift through the water. <clears throat> um, these can be a little puzzling to make out their form. Um, these are called urn tunicates. Each one of these structures is actually a colony of animals. Um, so every individual animal has two siphons. Um, they all join to the outside surface. So each of these little tiny holes on the outside is the in-current siphon to an animal. All of their out-current siphons join in the hollow center of this to a common um, <clears throat> hole where they, ex they exhale. So each one of these is a colony of roughly 100 animals. And then these, in turn, tend to form colonies of these larger structures as well. <clears throat> but looked at close enough and dissected, it's the same body plan as these other things. So the tunicates are primitive chordates. Um, reefs, of course, have higher animals as well. Um, sharks are more primitive than fish. Um, Sharks don't have a proper skeleton. Um, their group, elasmobranchs, um, their skeleton is um, made of cartilage rather than bone. <clears throat> and so there are a number of features of sharks that make them pr more primitive from a biology standpoint than fish. Um, this one is a Caribbean reef shark, probably three or four inches long. Um, this is a hammerhead shark I shot in the Galapagos, um, probably four or five feet long. <clears throat> um, so rays um, also don't have a proper skeleton. Um, th this one is a manta ray. Um, so again, cartilaginous. Um, the, probably um, 10 or 12 feet across. You can tell how much larger this ray is than the di 
diver photographing it. Um, it's my friend Robin. <clears throat> this was shot in Komodo. Um, the, these guys, so they're kind of odd looking if you've never looked closely, but like there's an eye here. So there's eyes on either side of the head. These two flaps um, are, are feeding tentacles they use to help guide food into their mouth, which is in the front edge of the body. You can see gill slits here um, that they have to breathe. So they draw water in through their mouth and out through the gill slit is how they pass water over their gills <clears throat> to get oxygen. Um, and these are reef mantis. These are the small ones. There are also oceanic mantis that can be more than 20 feet across. And I've seen those as well. I've never managed to photograph one with a person in the shot at the same time. So there's no sense of how large they are, but it's quite interesting to be in the water with something that big. Then of course they're fish. Um, this talk isn't really about fish. So yeah, there's a couple thousand different kinds of fish you'd find on a reef. Um, we now have a proper skeleton made of bone. Um, the biology of fish, probably somewhat familiar to most of you. A lot of shapes, sizes, and colors. Um, moving up more complex than fish are reptiles. There are a couple kinds of reptiles found on the reef. This is a sea turtle. This one's a hawksbill turtle. Um, reptiles are air breathers. So these guys, you see them underwater. You see them sleep underwater. They have to go up to the surface to take a couple of breaths of air about once every hour to hour and a half, or they will drown. Um, so even when they're sleeping, they sleep for an hour and then go take a breath and go back down and sleep again. Um, they spend all their time in the ocean until it's time to lay eggs. And then they go up on land, lay their eggs on a beach and go back in the water. When the eggs hatch, the babies make a mad dash from the beach into the water and stay in the water the rest of their lives. Um, sea turtles aren't the only reptiles in the water. This is a sea snake. Um, it is a proper snake, like kind you would see on land. It's covered with scales. It's an air breather. Um, they can only hold their breath for a shorter period of time than the turtles. So you regularly see them going up to take a breath. But again, they spend most of their lives in the ocean, only going ashore to lay eggs. And where the sea turtles tend to eat sponges and, and algae, um, sea snakes eat small fish. Um, and given their snake, they can poke into holes in the reef looking for fish. You see them chase fish out. Um, they are poisonous. In fact, their venom is quite dangerous, but their fangs are really short and they're not considered a problem for people. Um, they couldn't bite through a wetsuit and even I've, I've seen them curl around someone's arm or leg on a dive and it's not really cause for alarm um, unless you actively threaten them or try and injure them, they're not going to hurt you. Um, moving up from reptiles, the, I don't have pictures of seabirds. There are birds that dive underwater to chase fish. Um, and then there are mammals. Um, these are dolphins. Dolphins aren't commonly seen around reefs, but they are occasionally. Um, these I also photographed in the Galapagos. Um, part, part of the reason divers rarely see dolphins, they don't like the air bubbles from scuba divers. So they tend to avoid scuba divers. So it, I've only had two or three dives ever where I've seen um, dolphins while diving. Um, I've seen more of them while, while snorkeling because they're not afraid of snorkelers, but they, for the most part, avoid scuba divers. And of course, there are people on reefs. Um, <laughs> this is my, my friend, Keith, and I partly took the shot. The camera rig I use for these shots is very similar to the one Keith is holding. Um, it's a typical land camera in a special underwater housing with a big glass dome over the lens and two lights on long arms. I can point the lights in different directions. And that is my talk. Are there any questions? Oh, thank you. I'm sorry I seem to run over a bit. Oh, that's great. Well, 
Thank you, Mark. Yeah. That was awesome. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, well, um, if there are no qu questions, Nick, I see that Nicole's on, and I'm wondering if she would like to introduce her talk that for that will be our next month's talk. Uh, okay. Well, I'm working on it. It's going to be about the. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Uh, it's going to be on the Loire Valley, but not the way you're accustomed to. It's not going to dwell on castles you know a lot or big things you know, but hidden treasures that non uh, that then that foreign tourists don't see. Uh, and that the people who live around there or their family or their friends go see. There are lots of very interesting things. I may show maps in relation to the castles, a couple of castles, you know, but mostly it's going to be um, about things that I'm pretty sure nobody that you know has ever seen. And I'm lucky enough that my godfather's youngest daughter is there and we go every time we go i go visit her i discover new things with her and she's lived there for maybe 20 odd years so that's what it's going to be thank you Nicole. Okay. mark did i cut you off did you want to say one oh, more thing gene was trying to ask a question I, was yeah. I, I i don't know where we are in the time or people to go i actually have two questions but i i guess if you mind full time one my my first question is could you speak a little bit about what um climate change and sea you know warming is is impacting what you're seeing at the reefs and then secondly i was just flabbergasted a little bit about i guess there's the biology of phylum as it become more sophisticated but i was i'm which maybe doesn't have anything to do with intelligence because I look at um, uh, the octopus. I, what's the movie? My friend, the, what's oh, the movie? Yeah. The octopus the, teacher. But the octopus teacher, right? Everyone, who, if no one hasn't seen the octopus teacher, you have to watch the octopus teacher. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm, I'm amazed that the intelligence, because I see them as these, these creatures that have high intelligence, but they're lower than you know, the starfish. So it's, it's the biology of how their system works that makes them lower than intelligence. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. In fact, I, I think even scientists don't understand about evolution of intelligence, why you can have simple creatures like mollusks that are as smart as octopuses and some more evolved creatures that have very little intelligence. Um, to address your first question, though, um, certainly I see a lot of um, change on the reefs in the, in the time I've been diving. Um, <clears throat> there are um, a number of impacts from climate change. Um, there's um, coral bleaching, which comes um, largely from the increased temperatures, um, but Storms that get worse cause mechanical damage. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of things going on and other human impacts that aren't climate related. Um, one of the biggest problems is agricultural runoff. Oh. Modern agriculture, we put so much fertilizer on fields um, and most of that fertilizer disappears the first time um, it rains. So that prompts farmers to put more and more on every week. Mm. And it all just washes away and ends up in the ocean. And um, when that happens near reefs, so uh, Australia's Great Barrier Reef is a reef off the coast of an industrialized nation. The, the thing that has a lot of reefs not in such bad shape is most reefs are off um, developing nations that don't have well-developed industry, which means those nations aren't polluting their reefs as, as badly. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, so there's a lot of threat to reefs, and, and I've seen that. Um, and it doesn't affect everything equally. Right. Um, for instance, so one of the more primitive groups I showed, those comb jellies, the Black Sea, 
used to be a very rich um, inland sea for, for fishing. It has been taken over by comb jellies because um, so much pollution has gone into it that the form of pollution that's gotten in there um, is a nutrient that the comb jellies like and they have reproduced and there are billions and billions of comb jellies that are choking out the fish. So there's an ecological disaster in the Black Sea. So some of these changes upset the balance. Some things are dying, other things thrive, and that isn't always a good thing. Mm. Thank you. I have a question. You mentioned all these poisonous things. Have you ever been hurt? Did you ever have to go see a doctor yourself for something like well, that? Um, so the rule of thumb is don't touch anything. I know, but did you almost learn nothing, that? It, almost nothing is going to go out of its way to jump out at you and try and attack you. Um, I, yes, I, I have had stings. I've accidentally touched a few things. Um, very few things are life-threateningly dangerous. Um, and the, what, the ones that are tend to not be very common. And um, so most of my scuba diving has been um, organized through a commercial dive operator. Before every dive, they talk about where we're diving, what we're likely to see, what to be aware of. So th there are warnings for things that are expected. Um, and scuba diving isn't that dangerous. There are plenty of things on land that are as dangerous as well. Um, how often do you worry when you walk out of your house, you're gonna be hit by a car? You're more likely to be hit by a car and killed than I am on a dive to be bit by one of these things. Um, it's just a matter of knowing what the dangers are and how to avoid them. Um, so, but that said, I get minor stings. Um, small jellyfish aren't uncommon. Um, so even in warm tropical seas, I tend to wear a full wetsuit. So I have almost no exposed skin. Um, for the most part, it's only part of my face that's exposed. I wear a hood, um, gloves, and a full suit and boots. So, um, so bumping into jellyfish, they're not likely to sting me. However, every now and then one will brush my cheek and it, you may think, oh, I'm being sloppy bumping into them. Um, some jellyfish have stinging tentacles that can be dozens of feet long and almost impossible to see the tiny threads. So that, that's how you can bump into them without realizing it. Um, so that's one example I mentioned with the fire urchins. I once brushed my leg against one without having seen it was there, excruciating pain. And when I first felt that, I'm like, what happened? Did something cut my leg off? It, that kind of, and I looked down and the there was nothing obviously attacking me and oh, there's the urchin. And kind of just spent the next 30 seconds focused on trying to call myself, don't hyperventilate, you're okay. And the pain subsided. And because at first I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to end the dive. And um, of course, I'm 30, 40 feet deep. Um, it takes a couple of minutes to surface safely from that. And I'm thinking, okay, I need to signal to the dive guide and my buddy that I've, I'm hurt. I have to, um, there's hand signals you learn for all of these things. And in the time I just kind of chilled, got my breathing under control and relaxed, the pain subsided and two or three minutes later it was gone. So I, I didn't even have to cancel the dive. The, um, there are things that are more dangerous. So yeah, the, the urchin hurts a lot, but doesn't really injure you. Um, scorpion fish and stonefish are fish that have spines that disguise themselves as rocks and have spines sticking out that have venom in them. Um, those hurt a lot, 
they're not life threatening, but they hurt enough. You probably want to end the dive. It doesn't just go away. Um, but those are treatable. The, the venom in them breaks down with heat. Um, submerge your hand in hot water as hot as you can stand, 105, 110 degrees, and that will break down the poison. So that's what you do. And the, the kind of people I dive with, the boats we dive from have first aid kits that have treatments for a lot of the common things that people are gonna run into. That if you have a brush with one of the more dangerous jellyfish, there are lotions you can spread afterwards that will help calm that. So th there are treatments for these things. Um, for the most part, I don't really worry about it. The, but the number one thing is don't touch anything. Keep your distance. And I mean, I get closer to things as a photographer. So a lot of, a lot of those shots, particularly the small things, my camera is probably an inch or two from what I'm photographing. And that, which means I'm getting in really close and my elbows are sticking out. So there's where I'm likely to accidentally bump things. Um, so to be a photographer like this, you need to be very good at managing your position while diving and to be able to swim backwards to back away from things after you've taken a shot. Um, and you don't want to damage the reef, injure creatures by mistake, as well as hurting yourself. So yeah, you just have to learn how to not hurt anything, how to not touch anything. Any other questions? Mark, you have a question in the chat. Oh, whoops, I didn't even have the chat open. About the sand. So the kind of sand on beaches, say up around here, is very different from what's on the tropical beaches. Um, so like beaches on the New England coast and most subtropical places um, are basically um, primarily quartz that's been, or actually not quartz. Um, I forget what the stuff's called, it's glass. My that, yeah. Um, whereas in the tropical areas, most of the sand is calcium carbonate. So um, white sand beaches are, are this. Um, so some of it is crushed coral, broken shells. Um, it turns out a significant amount of the sand in tropical areas is created by parrotfish. Um, parrotfish are large fish, with very strong jaws with a parrot-like beak, and they eat living coral. So they scrape the flesh off of coral, off the coral skeleton, and in doing so, also get pieces of skeleton, which pass through them, they poop it out, and it's now in tiny little pieces. So they create sand out of coral. So arguably those white sand tropical beaches is all parrotfish poop. Um, but so, but you ask about um, the qualities of the sand. So around a reef, there are places where the sand looks pretty clean and places where it doesn't. There are places where the sand is full of rubble of broken things and different creatures like different kinds of sand. So there are um, several kinds of fish that like soft sand that's kind of slippery and they can basically swim through the sand. Um, mm -hmm. Other fish that dig holes that like sand that's got gravel in it so that it'll keep its shape when you dig a hole in it. Um, there are places where the sand looks dirty. It's got decaying organic matter in it and all kinds of stuff. Um, that's what those sea cucumbers like to eat so that they can digest the organic matter off of the sand. There's a lot of different kinds of sand. And with experience of looking for interesting thing, living things around the reefs, you learn what's likely to be in different kinds of sand just from looking at the sand. Have you ever 
gone near um, sunken ships because we've seen through glass boats we've seen so not the animals you showed us but a lot of corals that were and i noticed that a lot of the times more fish and more coral were near those sunken ships have you gone there um so i've done a little bit of diving around shipwrecks yeah. um there are divers who specialize in that who really like visiting shipwrecks um i'm into diving for the wildlife so i will dive a wreck if it's got interesting wildlife in and around it but not just for the sake of visiting a wreck yeah um and so in some places wrecks can get colonized with coral and other encrusting organisms pretty quickly um so like in florida they've purposely sunk a bunch of ships to make artificial reefs um within a couple of years you start to see some stuff growing on it and 10 to 20 years later it can become almost completely covered um so the the places where i dive i don't see a whole lot of wrecks um like in fiji where i go the most there used to be a wreck we would dive most trips um through a big hurricane came through a couple of years ago and the wreck slid down the slope and disappeared I'm, I'm sure it's still there but it's far too deep for recreational divers now um but like diving in the solomon islands um i've been on a number of world war ii wrecks and as i say i'm not that interested in it for the history but the, those World War II wrecks are now, what, 70 years old. They're completely encrusted with stuff. And so it becomes interesting for just the animals there. Um, there are people who like going inside wrecks. That's really dangerous. So I say scuba diving is not that dangerous. Um, there are things about it that can be dangerous. One is going inside wrecks. Um, inside wrecks are dangerous because one the boats rust over time and tend to fall apart so the boat can collapse on you uh, <laughs> nice uh mask <laughs> um i found this a very immersive experience <laughs> <laughs> yeah also shipwrecks are dangerous there tend to be um sharp bits and pointy bits that can get you because the boats are almost always damaged in some way um the boats tend to fill with silt and if you're not careful swimming into a room as you kick your feet to fin along um you stir up that silt and it can suddenly have wide out conditions where you can't see anything so people just get lost inside wrecks so yeah i tend to not go inside wrecks i find it too dangerous Any other questions? Just an observation that I thank you so much that I can't. And it's, it's just amazing to me the diversity of creatures and colors and patterns and shapes. It, it just, and I guess what I wonder is, is that this is an odd question mark, but um, how, if uh, any way, does that impact your view of the world well i start learned how to dive because i was fascinated by coral reefs as a kid watching jacques cousteau specials um later i got into aquariums and so the entire ocean isn't like a coral reef um Coral, the relationship of coral reefs to the rest of the ocean is kind of like comparing tropical rainforests to the rest of the earth. It, it's the most diverse um, area. There's intense competition among species. Everything's trying to eat everything else. So um, the creatures develop all these different ways to hide, to protect themselves. Um, the ones that develop poisons 
then produce bright colors to warn the predators I'm poisonous. So then you start seeing all these colors. Um, so yeah, I've been fascinated by that for as long as I can remember. Um, how does it change my worldview? I mean, I'm aware of the dangers of, to the reef, um, the risks of losing them entirely. Um, I'm also interested in, in tropical rainforests. I've been to Central and South America a couple of times looking at that. Um, so I'm fascinated by all this, want to preserve it. And it's tough because the act of being a tourist, of traveling somewhere like that and going through that habitat um, is actually going to degrade the habitat a little. So I worry about this kind of, I can love it to death. And so it's like, how often should I visit? Should I give up and quit visiting? There's value in educating others about it. So a certain amount of people don't care about what they don't know about. So a certain number of people visiting to educate others about what's there and why they should care is actually really valuable and worth a certain amount of degradation in the habitat. Deciding where to draw the line is difficult. Um, then as a photographer, I have to worry about it. Um, Photographers get a bad rap in some circles, and I've seen photographers harass wildlife to get a shot. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to decide how much of that makes sense or not. Um, I won't say I've never touched anything. I try to, part of the reason that I understand the biology of a lot of these things the best way to get the shots is to understand what you're taking pictures of, what its behavior is, where to find it. Mm -hmm. And then, so some things like sea cucumbers are really slow moving. They're not gonna run away. They're not really gonna be harmed much by being picked up. Um, I've picked them up and turned them over because interesting things live on them. Those two brightly colored shrimp I showed a picture of live on sea cucumbers they stay on the underside of the cucumber. The only way you're ever going to see them is to pick up a cucumber and turn it over. Um, on the, so if I'm somewhere on a boat that goes out in the middle of nowhere that divers rarely visit and I pick up a cucumber, I may well be the only person who will ever touch that cucumber. If I'm hundred feet offshore of a resort that leads snorkelers out every day and they let people pick up the cucumber, that cucumber is going to be picked up multiple times a day every day and possibly harassed to death. So is it fair that I can pick it up because I go somewhere where there aren't many people? I actually worry about some of these things and think about them and try and decide where to draw the line. Mm -hmm. um, and there are places where I used to be able to handle some of the wildlife to get photos and the dive operators have said, we think the wildlife isn't happy with this. We don't want anyone touching it anymore. And I, I always respect requests like that and try to think about it anytime I'm going to touch something. And of course, I wouldn't touch it if I don't know what it is and what dangers it poses to me and what I might pose to it. So part of that is understanding what I'm looking at for that. But yeah, there's a lot of issues around being a tourist in these places. Thank you. It's fascinating. Yes, it certainly is. Well, what you mentioned is really true everywhere in the world. Uh, in, for example, in Bora Bora, or in Hawaii, or uh, I mean, I'm talking about places we've been, or a variety of places where we did a little scuba diving, but 
what I did is I didn't want to disturb anything. So I lay flat, I didn't move. And I had the weird feelings. The fish were coming to me. I'm a photographer, but I didn't take any photos. I just lay there and it was, I don't think I disturbed anything, but there weren't any other people. But you're quite right. If people go around and touch and, you know, in in Brazil, I've had butterflies landing on me the size, each wing the size of one hand. But as soon as you move, I guess you disturb them. They're afraid of nothing. Right. Well, so this is something a lot of people don't get when they go out in the wild areas. They walk along hoping to see things and don't see much. Yeah. Be very still, sit in one place, not moving for five or 10 minutes, and the wildlife will come to you and you will see it. That's true in forests here, in yeah, top of the rainforest, diving on the reef. Um, if you keep moving, you're not going to see a whole lot. And a lot of people don't have the patience to just quietly stay in one place, not moving. But that's how you see a lot of these things. It's always a pleasure to have you show us your slack. It's wonderful. You're welcome. I'm always happy to share my wildlife photography. And oh, I'm happy to watch. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.